Can you hear me? Great. So I'll be brief, uh, but it's my pleasure to uh, introduce to you <clears throat> Deputy Mayor Ann Williams Isom, who has agreed to join us today to offer some remarks about the arrival and care of asylum seekers in New York City. Uh, the Deputy Mayor's office has, in coordination with her colleagues across many agencies in New York City, managed the reception of over 130,000 asylum seekers beginning in 2022 to the present. In effect, standing up shelter and referral programming, and I would say further in effect, developing and implementing a city-focused reception and placement program in the, in the vein of refugee resettlement. So a pretty stunning task and an accomplishment and no small feat. So Deputy Mayor, thank you for being here today. Thank you for sharing with us your experience. And I know you'll make remarks for five, seven or so minutes and then take questions from the audience. So grateful for you. Thank you. Great, thank you. How's that? I didn't know Fried Frank was in this building. Have you guys always been in this building? Have you? Yes. Oh, I didn't realize that. So thank you for having me. I am a Columbia Law School graduate and practiced for a little while. My husband met my husband there, and he's at a, another firm. And I have a daughter who just graduated a while back, and she's starting at Gibson Dunn a couple of weeks ago. So I'm very happy to be here. Um, one of the reasons I even say that is because sometimes you find yourself in a situation that you don't quite expect yourself to be in. So I am a learned, uh, an attorney by training, practiced law for a little while, and then I actually went to work for the Administration for, um, Administration for Children's Services because I was very interested in government and public service. After that, I went to work at a nonprofit called the Harlem Children's Zone, which is one of the largest nonprofits in Harlem where we really focus on the, something crazy in America, which is giving children what they need for as long as they need it, and giving their parents the support that they need so that they can have thriving lives, and was very happy to be there. Went to Fordham afterwards. I see my, co my colleagues there. I am a Fordham undergrad graduate, so went to become the Dumpson Chair there, which is a chair that's focused on child welfare, again, and children's services, and was there for about 18 months before I got a call to come back to city government. Didn't really know this mayor, wasn't really interested in being a deputy mayor, but when um, we were coming out of COVID and was really seeing the state in which New York City was in and what needed to happen and wanted to think that I wanted to stand up to, to help to bring back New York City and be supportive. So as a deputy mayor of Health and Human Services, it just happened to be by happenstance that the mayor's office of immigrant affairs is under me and also the, the um, homeless services system. And so as we started to see migrants coming into the system,
federal government. The use of this site is an affirmation of what we've said for many months. We are over capacity. I'm, and I'm sure you've already spoken about Massachusetts, who got up to sep no shade to Massachusetts. I'm just saying, if I had 7,500 families, I'd be dancing and like, this would be all good. <laughs> and they're like, we can't do it anymore. And I was like, OK, must be nice. They can't do it anymore. And now there are people putting people on a waiting list, which I don't know what that looks like. I know that I feel proud that we have not seen any families and children sleeping on the street, and that we put our body in front of that as public servants and as nonprofits to make sure that that never happens. It's important to us that we double down on resettlement strategies and we help people continue on their journey wherever that might be. But we also need federal government to finish the job. They've allowed thousands of people into this country, which we understand and we support, with no opportunity for self-sufficiency. People want to work. It's the first thing that they say to us as they start their path from shelter to independence. But we need to make sure that we're doing more in order to help them to do that. You all should be proud, and I know it's mixed messages sometimes, but New York City is playing its role. In the summer, we opened a first-of-its-kind national model to help people file for their federal, application, um, federal asylum applications. We have helped over 6,000 individuals and families process their federal asylum applications and are also helping people with their temporary um, protected status and work authorization applications. And we know that there's so much more to do, and that's not the beginning, and it doesn't mean that people get jobs right away, but they're so anxious to find some help and to get it done that we feel proud that we've been able to do that with the help of many people probably in this room. We led with our values, and we have made those values come to life with our actions, with actions from the city government, with partners, with businesses, and legal and academic and community organizations, with a whole of city effort. We know that the government can't do it alone, and probably not the best person to do it, so we continue to welcome ideas and solutions from community-based organizations like CMS, as we know migrations are not only happening in our country, but all over the world. I'll leave you with this. This inflow is continuing. We don't see an end in sight. And I know many of you are experts in this field and are closer to this work. But what we do see are opportunities. We know that if we really can do this right, immigrants have always been the backbone of New York City and the backbone of our country. It's important we help people continue on their journey so that they can thrive and raise their families. What is needed is more action from our partners. We will continue to do our part. We, other, we need others to work with us and to make sure that we're able to keep that pledge of not having any families and children on the street. What I say sometimes to my staff is a very low bar, but that's where we feel that we are when we're still getting 3,200 people in a week and still trying to, with no slowdown that we see of that, um, but we are doing our best, and you should be proud of that. Thank you very much, and I'll take some questions. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, if there are questions. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, my name is John. <clears throat> excuse me. My name is John Slocum. I'm the executive director of an organization called Refugee Council USA, which is a national umbrella association of refugee serving agencies. Um, this many cities are dealing with this, and I'm curious about the extent to which you're in communication with other municipalities. What you've gotten out of that communication, whether there's an ongoing role for civil society in helping facilitate that communication, and or an advocacy role. Uh, with the federal government beyond the immigration policy uh, re reform we so desperately need. Thank you. So thank you for that question. And um, very early on, I think Chicago was the first maybe um, a city that we reached out to. And then after, we've been having conversations with Denver, to a lesser extent, Houston, LA, I'm forgetting another, and recently, Massachusetts. So it's been very interesting because people are saying to us like, so how did you get, what are you guys doing? And how did you get your tent put up? And how, you know, how are you paying for this? And what are you doing? And is the White House taking your telephone calls? It was people really looking to us as New York City to lead. And so we've had questions, we've had conversations about strategies on the ground because honestly people are overwhelmed, right? When you see those images in Chicago of people sleeping on the floor in pre police precincts, can you imagine that happening here? Like no, for all kinds of reasons, no, but that's where folks are at, are people in airports. Denver was saying to people after a period of time, 
okay, so we're only, I think they might have been the first person to put in um, time limits. And they were basically saying, after you leave us, maybe go to New York because they have right to shelter and you can sit, you can go there and you can be in a hotel and you can stay, right? So every, there was no coordination, which at its, at its core, when we, you know, I didn't know the word decompression strategy, but I learned it. And it was this idea of, well, if people are coming across the border, could there be somebody that's down at the border directing people where to come? Could we be giving resources to different cities? Could we be resettling people from that point? OK, well, if that can't happen, can you help us coordinate with the cities that are seeing the influx now to see where are their jobs? Where are their places? Where is this housing? I don't have to tell you all how expensive it is to live in New York City. There are other places in the country that need um, populations and need workers and have housing. Can someone help us? do that. We've looked to the state to do that a little bit. And I, you'll be surprised or not surprised that the state would say, well, maybe after the election, we can help you. Or maybe after this. Everyone keeps on telling us they're going to help us eventually. But there is no real coordination. So we've started to reach out to places. And there was one, Minnesota, I think, has something where they were willing to take some migrants. Baltimore has said that they've been willing to take some migrants. Now, the tricky thing about that, just on the side, there's all these hotels that are probably seeing problems because of their um, not enough people going back to them after COVID and want to be like, New York City, I hear that you're paying top dollar. We have some hotels here in, in Minneapolis if you want to. And we're like, first of all, that's not resettlement. People living in hotels is not resettlement. And no, we have enough price gouging right here in New York City. Thank you very much. We don't need to send people all the way to Minneapolis for that. So I've been really disappointed with the lack of, um, even if the national government didn't want to do anything, they could just kind of quarterback this for us, and they've been unwilling to do that. Thank you. Um, I just had a comment I want to observe as one of the firms that's been participating since the summer in the um, Asylum Application Help Center for anybody in other cities or other parts of the country who um, is looking to deal with a similar problem, one thing that I think has been brilliant about the mayor's office program is the hiring of staff and in particular consultants to be the expert supervisors that really help the core level application preparers get this done. There's a training, but you know, a one hour training doesn't equip somebody to do an asylum application. But having the supervisors on site who can really answer the questions interface with the applicants and drill down so these applications can get completed and filed in one or two appointments has really been brilliant. And I just, I want to say how important I think that is to the success of the effort as a whole. And the city has supported that. So it needs that so financial support needs to come from somewhere to make thank, that model thank, work. Thank you for the shout out. I think that, um, you know, we didn't want to there's nothing unique about us standing up something like this. Again, the state could do something like this. The federal government could do something like this. But we thought that we could do it at scale. And there's many you know, legal providers for this population, but we wanted to kind of stand up something at scale. I also have been really gratified with the amount of young lawyers who have stood up to volunteer and to do this pro bono and how they have said it has changed their life and their experience of what it means to be a lawyer. So the, I do think that there are opportunities and golden moments in this. Um, I just wish we didn't feel so much that we were under a gun financially in the city, where you know there's so many fiscal cliffs that we are heading into right now because of the COVID money that's going away, because of the spending that happened way before this administration, and now because of the unexpected cost of the migrant crisis. It sort of goes against what we want to do. If we're trying to get streets clean. We're trying to make sure that we have you know, the, the crime down, all of the things that we're seeing. We don't want to go backwards. And we just think it's unfair that some of this should be on the backs of New York City financially when we know that there are solutions here. Thank you. I'm Bishop uh, Nicholas Tavares, a retired bishop of Brooklyn. I've been working in migration for all of 50 years. One of the things I've seen, especially in these massive issues, uh, Cuban Haitian influx, for example. Why didn't we ask some questions of the people? Because then you have a record and you know what happened. And, uh, right now, we are really dealing with the a lot of unknowns. I'm sure you're asking as many questions as you can, but there are organizations that can uh, do that and can do some research that will give us the record for the future. Just hoping you would be open to other organizations coming and saying, look, let us help uh, 
in documenting what happened. So, hi. I've been. I've heard a lot about you. So, <laughs> they come over and try to get your autograph before I leave. But Bishop, why are you assuming that we're not asking questions? I didn't know. I said I'm sure you are, but I'm just saying that. You said I know you are, like your dad says it. Like I know you're not, but you really are. <laughs> we are. So we do right at the very, very beginning. Right. So. At the very beginning, we weren't asking people's status because we're a city that doesn't ask people's questions like that in order to give them shelter, right? And then halfway through this, we were like, no, we've got to ask people questions because we have to know where they're coming from. We have to know how they got here. We have to know what they want to do. We have to do case management. We have to make sure what kind of um, uh, services we can give to them. So we actually did, a, I'm looking at um, James, I think we're 96% done with the whole population of an assessment that shows every single person, where they are, where, which shelters they're in, what do they need, what kind of case management. So we are asking all of those questions. The second part is we are working working with all of many, many, many organizations. The problem is we need more money to give to smaller organizations who are more experts in this work. And so funding from the state, I think they've given us some money for um, case management and also for the legal services. But again, I think more resources to the people who are experts. I, I am not an expert in this. And so we would love to, we've said that this should not be on the back of a homelessness system, right? This is not a homelessness issue. This is a immigration issue. This is a migration issue. And so if people want New York City to now take a role in that, then we should be pop, you know, appropriately funded, which is actually, I was throwing shade on Massachusetts, but the reason that they said that they weren't going to do it anymore is because they said we have not been appropriated the funds from the legislature in order to do that. Well, that's wonderful, right? And so that concept of if I don't have money, then I'm not going to be able to do it, right? That's not the New York, that's not our way of doing it. So I think we've really got to figure out what our solutions are. But very nice to meet you. Another question here, Deputy. Thank you very much for your talk. It's really fascinating. Diana Barnes from Skidmore College. I teach U.S.-Mexico border studies. I just have a quick question about the number of folks who have left the city. And you said they are resettled. Can, do you track where these folks go and how, what their resettlement looks like? So it's very interesting because I think now 18 months into this, people have come and then they're either doubled up or they found a place. Many of them are working, right? By the way, that's a little secret that we all know that they're working, but they're just not working legally. And they have found a place where they then tell their brothers and their families or their families to come up and stay with them. So it could be, you know, there was, it was some strange place like Topeka, Kansas, you know, people are going to, or whether it's upstate or different places. I think people are creating community, which is one of the strange things because I think Venezuelans were about 40% of our um, population here in New York City, and they didn't naturally have a community. Uh, again, I'm going back to Massachusetts. A lot of the folks that are getting there are Haitian, and so they were saying that a lot of the single men are like sleeping on people's couches, or the churches are dealing with them. So I think people are, are at 18 months into this are making their own way, finding their own community, finding housing for themselves, and are also working. So we haven't seen, and the, I don't know, Professor, but I know that we would hear it if somebody was like, New York City is sending me all these people and we have this influx of now homeless people. We have not heard that. I don't know if we will hear it, but we have not heard that. Hi, Marciana. Oh, sorry. I was looking at my friend over there. Sorry. Hi. My name is Stephanie Ortega. I work for Kids in Need of Defense. I am actually a Chicago native, and so I'm very familiar with everything that's going on over there um, and people sleeping in airports now at, at O'Hare, especially in the police municipalities as well. Um, I There have been a lot of discussion between aldermen and the community um, on the city council of Chicago talking about reevaluating their status as a sanctuary city. And I was just curious if New York City also is like hearing those conversations or maybe since New York City is also kind of leading and acting as kind of like a consultant and advisor to other cities, what would those discussions look like for Chicago and other cities that are also considering, you know, their position as a sanctuary city? So, so let me say this, and I don't, there has been no discussion of us not being a sanctuary city, right? That's who we are at our core. We have talked about the right to shelter and modifying the right to shelter and what can be done to kind of slow down the um, front door of the system and whether that's through some eligibility. It's, if you think about it, putting a 30-day limit on families is kind of a modification to the right to shelter. So some of those things that we're doing is what we've been talking about when we go into court on right to shelter. 
I, the thing, and I don't, you're from Chicago, so you should let, let me know if this is true. I've been amazed at the resistance from the communities of color there. And communities of color who are probably like my mom, who every now and then is like, but I don't understand. When I came here, this is what I did. And why are people doing X, Y, P? Like, right? New immigrants, immigrants and older immigrants and them this feeling of I didn't get this and what's going on. I think we've got to hold steady in this moment and not pit people up against each other and tell people there's enough love to go around. And you know, we're talking about people who have come here for good reasons. And just, you may your situation may have been different, but we have to go there. I think that's what we've been trying to do on the ground, is not necessarily pit people against each other. And I've, we've clearly seen that in some of the places where we've tried to put shelters, right, here in, in New York City. But I think we're trying to just get above that. And I think the way you get above that is provide what people need, have the resources that you need, and make sure that you are reminding people that we're not taking, uh, robbing from Peter to pay Paul, that everybody, a lot of people are struggling, and everybody should get what they need. Just a few more questions. Thank you so much. I'll be very brief. First of all, thank you for all your support and for bringing different voices together to inform what you're trying to do so we can all work together on this. Employment, it's a federal issue. We know this. Some people don't, but this is known. This is not something to be blamed on the city. However, there are some loopholes in the legislation regarding ways in which people can engage, be engaged in employment. Is there anything the city does or anything that we can help with to engage with the employers and try to, uh, to start matching people based on the skills they are bringing with the needs of the job market? So two things. There's been a bunch of um, business leaders who have um, stood up for this. Danny Myers, Andrew Riggi, is that his last name? So a bunch of people who are, why don't we do internships or um, apprenticeships with people right now um, as, so that when they get their working papers, they'll be able to work. So there is that going on right now. I also know that the state has put up a website, right? And I'm going to say this wrong, but I want to say there's like 18,000 jobs that are on there so people can have access to it. There are a bunch of agricultural jobs that we know that are available upstate once the weather changes a little bit. So the answer, Marciana, is yes to all of it, but all of that takes resources and organizations and takes people to step up in order to do that. But we know that there are jobs, somebody told me that there's maybe 10,000, maybe probably more food services jobs that are available right now. And so could we connect people to those? I'm, I'm thinking even further than that, we get So yeah, yes, and I think that when it feels for, like, so who should do that, right? So is it us who's just trying to shelter people and make sure that we're getting people done, or is there somebody, and I know that there is because we're all very smart, who should be now taking on that other part of now that they're here and we've gotten them settled and the kids are in school and everybody's you know, got their vaccinations and everything, now, now what and what do we connect them to? I heard that there was more questions over here, and I, I'm willing. Uh, James, I'll just take a couple of more. Oh, he said two more, but I'll, sorry. James, you're not the boss of me. <laughs> um, hello, my name is Amaya Sancho. I'm a third year Osnum scholar at St. John's University in Queens, New York. And um, I was just wondering where you think the shift in self sufficiency in like the post or older. Um, immigrant population in today's population, um, where it happened, and what are feasible and practical solutions to instill more self-sufficiency in today's migrant population? So, I mean, that's, tell me your first name again. Amaya. Amaya, that's a really interesting question, because, gosh, I would say that a person who makes their way and does the trip that many of these folks did are, by definition, self-sufficient. And I would say, right, Somebody want to clap for that? Y'all can clap for that. I do think we have a different way of thinking about, and this is so messed up, so don't. The population that was traditionally homeless in New York City does have to do other kinds of problems. It could be mental health problems, could be you know, domestic, domestic violence have been in the system, for, dependent on systems for a long time. That is not the people that we're seeing come here now. And so when we often say, OK, you're here, we're getting settled, they're really like, OK, so where's the job? And I'm not, why, why am I living in a hotel? That's not what I was told that was going to happen. So they're ready to move on. They're not here sitting up with their feet up, just chilling. And I think that the more, and, and you know, when people upstate are like, no, we don't want to take them because we're afraid that they're not going to work, like it's just all not true. 
And so putting the pieces in place and the infrastructure in place, and that's why I say that the federal government has to finish the job. You did the right thing by opening up your arms, but you cannot then just put them there and not give them what they need. That is a recipe for disaster. So I think they are very self-sufficient. And, um, and yeah, that would be the way that I would answer that question. All right. Good. Oh, actually, I'm sorry, we had one here first. Oh, thank you. Ava Malona. I'm with the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services at DHS, and I'm from Massachusetts, so I'm very familiar uh, <laughs> with all that you're talking. So first, allow me to thank you for your leadership and the incredible work that has been done. And I heard the resource piece, but I was wondering any recommendations that you have for the federal government to support better. <laughs> the, resource, the resource is one. You talked about the state and the resource, but any... Um, solution oriented, you know, given all the challenges that we are all facing. Yeah, so. Um, we'll give you another 20 minutes. No, <laughs> it's just the three things. I think it is work authorization for more populations. I think that there's tons that they can do in the um, system so that we can speed up people's ability to work. I think a decompression strategy, which again, I never knew what that word meant, but it just meant I was going to say something bad, like take some responsibility and help people to settle in places where they will really be able to get settled. And I think they've been reluctant to do a federal declaration of emergency because I think they then feel like, but then I'm saying it's an emergency, but it would free up more resources. It would free up FEMA, who for very long has had to be hands off. And it would free up a lot of other um, money that we need. So I would say those would be the three things that I would do if I was in the White House. Good. Thank you. <laughs> James, what do you want your boss to do now? He's, I'm ready. <laughs> there you go. Deputy Mayor, thank you so of much course, of course. for your. I think you're right. There's enough love to go around. And we'll get some money to go around, too. Thank you so much. I think we'll now take a 10 minute break and then come back for the next panel of the afternoon, US responses. Thank you. <laughs>